Hi guys, um, welcome to chapter three, week three of Intro to Theater. Um, you are in my living room today between um, extensive dance rehearsals and a killer tap class. I'm a little sore and need a couch. Um, so grab a cup of coffee and a notebook and let's do this thing. Um, this is an awesome, awesome chapter. Um, analyzing theater, thinking and writing about live performance. So this is going to prepare you to do your live theater critiques, which again, I would encourage you to start now. Go see a show, write about it. You can take a couple of months, because remember this is the last paper that you'll submit, but you can take a couple of months to um, work on it and edit it and then turn it in if that's easier but um, between the third paper and then this final paper and I'm sure all of the other classes you're taking it'll probably be easiest for y'all to work on that now and then turn it in later just for the sake of like no stress during exam season um, all right so anyway audiences in the 21st century are used to watching actors perform on film television, DVD, or the internet. The experience of theater is different in many ways. An audience member could certainly attend the theater with no preparation and have a wonderful time, but understanding certain concepts will make the experience fuller and richer. In this chapter, we explore how to be an effective collaborator from the house. We discuss ways in which theater differs from television and film, ways to look and listen to enhance the theater experience, and how to analyze and evaluate performance, including an exploration of the role of the critic in the theater and special considerations for writing about theater. Major emphasis on that last one. All right. So, active participation. Even a live broadcast does not require the kind of active participation that is necessary in the theater. Watching live theater uh, tends to take more concentration than watching film or TV does. Okay, so basically it's just, you can put on a movie, you can watch a TV show, and um, there's not as much like work, I guess, probably for you to sit there and understand the movie I guess like you know think about the last movie that you really had to like put your phone down put everything down put the popcorn down and like sit there and like watch and think about it. I really feel like for me it may have been inception okay for the most part we have it on and even if you're not you can kind of be talking to other people or making dinner or whatever you still kind of have an idea of what's going on you cannot do that um, in a live theater production. There's there's too much going on. I think the fact that you have live people in front of you, it's just active participation. You're there, you're paying attention, you're focused, you're listening so you, that you understand the story. Um, Even attending the theater requires effort. You must be in a certain place at a certain time. You can't pause the performance when you feel like it. On the other hand, your viewing is less likely to be interrupted by events. Telephone call, a doorbell, a conversation in the room. In film and TV, the cameras and the director who picks the camera shots are highly selective. They make the choices for the viewers. In the theater, you choose what to watch. The actor at the side of the stage playing with his hair, the flickering stage light, or the leading lady delivering a speech center stage. Theater practitioners try to direct your audience or uh, your attention with movement, actor positioning, and lighting, but ultimately the choice is yours. Um, I think that's one of the the beauties of live theater is that there are so many things to watch, especially when you have um, different performers. There are just different things that catch your attention. There's a dinner theater that I worked at and that I um, go to every summer to visit. And their cast is a cast of 29. And I normally go a couple nights in a row. And, and what happens is each night I find somebody that I kind of follow their show. I really like them as a performer or I've met them and really like them as a person. And so you just, they may not be center stage, but you notice, okay, so-and-so is not on the stage right now or they come on and they're kind of doing their own thing stage right or they're playing an instrument 
stage left. Um, and so that's basically, um, you know, what uh, Wayne Scott is talking about uh, with a movie. You know, it's it's perfect. The director has gone through and edited and re-edited and reshot whatever he wants to to make sure that it it is exactly what he wants it to be. But that is not situation in the theater. Um, even having somebody sitting next to you and coughing can distract you more from the the show. You know what I mean? Like so, there's there's a lot going on and there's a lot to pay attention to, thus it requires more focus. All right, I was long-winded, but I wanted to get that. Um, sorry, I tried to position, I am directly under a fan light, so I feel it's kind of, re everything is reflecting. Um, all right, in the theater, choosing to participate Taking charge of the viewing experience and listening with special attention creates a more vivid communication event. Part of this ex excitement is generated by the possibility for two-way communication. In film and most television, there is no shared space for the viewers in performance, so any viewer response goes unseen and unheard by the actors. In the theater, however, actors are very aware of the presence of the audience and the actors' performances are in turn affected by the messages they receive. Laughs, gasps, silence, even wrestling of programs all communicate to the actors and in turn affect their communication of the stage. Um, so I had mentioned, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, my husband and I went to go see Pippin before we moved back to Tennessee. And first of all, the show was just really bizarre and I knew some of the music from it, but I, I don't know if it's like the story or if it was the performance, but I was really, really trying. And um, after about five minutes, my husband completely gave up to like try and understand it. But at one point, the actors started laughing at something that the audience did not understand, like just completely broke character and started laughing, which came off as like it made me more confused it almost seemed rude like there was an inside joke going on that we didn't get um but this past weekend i saw motown we were back in charlotte finishing up our, our season and um there was it could have been taken as the same situation but the audience was so involved in this show uh, because of the music of Motown, people were singing along, people were like cheering on the performances, that uh, there was one guy a couple of rows back from us, and there's this intense conversation going on on the stage between Barry Gordy and um, Smokey Robinson, and it's silence, and you hear this guy in the back, and he's like, you tell him, Smokey! The um, actors did not know what to do and they started laughing. Not, I mean, it was, you could tell it was something that they were trying to stay composed, but it like took a second that they had to compose themselves and that made them, it made it funny, it made them endearing. Totally the opposite experience from Pippin, okay? And, but so much of it was because of the participation of the audience. Um, so that is case in point right there. Um, with that two-way communication comes a certain responsibility. The people on stage are human beings. Respectful and courteous treatment is important. So much entertainment is brought into our living rooms that it is easy to forget, even in the movie theater, that talking, ringing cell phones, and beeping pagers, who is a pager, um, disturb other audience members. In the theater, they are even more distracting to the performers on stage. So yeah, if you have, um, you know, we talked last week, a Sunday afternoon crowd is always really hard to get laughs from, but I made another note. So at this dinner theater that I was talking about, when I was performing there, um, I had a friend who was in the cast with me and he had this tap solo 
fun. We called it a jut out, but you had the stage and then there was this little part of the stage that kind of um, protruded into the audience and there were, because uh, it was a dinner theater, there were tables on all sides. And um, he had this huge tap solo right on this jut out. And there was a girl who was not even paying attention. You know, you have somebody like me to, to you, to the computer screen, tapping and has all of this energy and is trying to get your attention. And she's sitting back on her phone, texting or whatever. And he tried to get in her face and ended up falling. Like not on top of her, but like he slipped and fell. And then it became this funny thing. The floor was so slick that he couldn't get back up and people had to like help him back up and stuff. But just her lack of interest, you know what I mean, made him work harder and, you know, then affected his performance. So it's, you know, it really is two-way communication. Uh, the next thing they talk about, the nature of live performance. There are drawbacks to live performances. Mistakes cannot be edited, as in film or television, correct, but they make the best stories. Um, there is less quality control. A wonderful performance cannot be saved. Even a video of a theatrical performance represents only a limited record of what happened from one point of view. You can't watch a favorite live performance again and again, nor can you create the feelings that were associated with that. But there is also a special attraction to being live. Although mistakes can and do occur, part of the theater's excitement is never knowing exactly what will happen next and perhaps even seeing how performers will deal with the occasional glitch. Okay, it's all, and I think that, going back to Motown, I think that's what made um, the audience respect the performers and really, uh, like, love, that's a strong word, but, you know, really appreciate their, their skill because, you know, you saw a little bit of weakness there and, you know, these are guys that have just come off of Broadway, but this, this dude in the back row, like, made them laugh and they had to compose it, it just it makes you feel part of the magic because you are part of the magic you're part of what makes their show um so great all right so here we talk about analyzing productions this is where we really get into the meat and we're going to go into um different things that will help you in writing your theater critiques and when you go see the show not that i want you to take like you know, active notes while you're watching, um, you know, whichever play or musical you choose to, but you'll know kind of what to look for. All right, so analyzing the production. When in the theater, it is important to be as open as possible to take in and soak up the immediate sensory experience. At some point, however, you will probably want to analyze the event. What just happened? How did it happen? What was its effect on me? With those questions, you will begin an analysis of the performance event. Your analysis can be as simple as thinking about the performance in the car, going home, or talking to friends about the experience over coffee. It can be as structured as an organized paper with clear assertions and strong support. Ding, that one. Although, you know, we can go to coffee and talk about it. <laughs> uh, that is also an option. All right. So in the minds of most audience members, reception is followed by understanding, which usually includes the meaning of what they are experiencing. The meaning of a play or a moment in the play can become something quite different for each audience member. And um, I think, you know, last week when we were talking about catharsis, you know, obviously if you are having, you know, a rough time, uh, in your marriage, maybe. I'm just throwing things out there. I'm not saying anything specific. My marriage is great. But if you're having a rough time with your marriage and then you go and you see um, a play that, you know, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof or something that is telling a story that you feel like is like, you know, lining right up with uh, where you are in life, you are going to feel very differently about that versus, you know, the kid who is in high school sitting right next to you that's just like, oh, okay, so that's really interesting. Um, 
in analyzing a production, it is helpful to make a distinction between observation and interpretation. Observation is your recognition of what actually happens on stage, um, where interpretation is your intuitive response, your subjective experience of what the physical action communicated. Okay, they give two examples here. Observation, the actress playing Carol sat down heavily in the chair and held her head in her hands. A photograph or video would verify your observation. While interpretation, Carol is depressed, sad, or exhausted. Although you and your neighbor might agree on your observation, you could very well have different interpretations of the behavior, okay? All right, thinking about actor performances. The audience can suspend disbelief and accept that a character, I'm sorry, and accept the character is genuine at least for the moment of performance. If we believe an actor's interpretation of a character, even as a cat or a dog, then we accept that the character as existing truthfully in the theatrical world is dramatized by the production. Okay, so one thing, and this is going to um, go into more about analyzing the actor specifically. So when you're critiquing, you want to make sure that you are analyzing observation versus, um, I'm sorry, not analyzing, but you want to make sure that what you're writing about um, is both observational and interpretational. And if it is interpretational, you're going to want to support um, those thoughts. So, you know, if you read a character as being, you know, sad and the character is actually exhausted? Is there other support saying that the character is sad? That kind of thing. Um, all right, so then you're also, so now we're going to go into looking at a performer um, and how you're critiquing um, believability, the actor's choices, the character interaction. Okay, so those are the three things that you're looking for. So believability. What enables the audience to accept the authenticity or believability of a character? The key might lie in beautifully written dialogue or it could be the actor's delivery of the dialogue. Much of what is identified as character is created first by a playwright, but the actor completes the creative process and provides the key to audience belief or lack thereof. Perhaps the actor creates the illusion that the words are being delivered for the first time. The delivery of a lesser actor might sound memorized, okay? And, um, you know, this is really important and it's really, really hard. Um, and I know that a lot of you may come to see uh, me and the Adams family and um, bring it on, I want your critique. Um, so, but basically what they're saying here is, you know, you go to the theater and you know that these people are gonna they're gonna get out of their costume when the show is over and they're gonna go about their lives right but in the moment that they're acting on stage you want to believe that they are who they are and or that they are who they're portraying I should say um, and you can often tell a strong actor from a weak actor because the dialogue and the interaction feels very natural where um, a weaker actor or a newer actor you can tell that you know if if there's interaction and somebody is saying their lines to them they are like going over and over and over in their head like what their line is and then and then feeding it to that actor or their movement is very choreographed it, it nothing is natural so believability is being natural on a stage that you believe that that is who the character is. So when you go to a performance, analyze that. Analyze that on all of your major leads. And you can highlight, you know, if there's something that sticks out to you as a positive thing, you know, um, and you can also analyze it um, not in a negative context necessarily, but there was a lack of this so the character wasn't believable, that kind of thing. So believability is a big one when you're analyzing characters. Um, actors' choices. 
One way to isolate an actor's contribution to character is to think in terms of actor choices. An actor's approach to movement, for example, may be significant. Is the actor setting an appropriate tempo for the character when crossing the stage or gesturing? Is the actor leading with an appropriate part of the body? For example, does movement seem to come first from the head, chest, or pelvis? Just these choices make a remarkable difference in the quality of the movement. Do the actor's movements seem appropriate to the character's age, profession, and social background and to the nature of the dramatic moment? Does the actor's physical bearing seem consistent with the words being spoken? Does the vocal quality seem appropriate for the character? These choices may be more apparent if you see an actor perform several different characters. Okay, so basically, um, if I am portraying um, a grandmother, I'm not going to be most likely wearing stiletto high heels and a short skirt. I may not be talking like this and I'm not going to be standing upright, right? Um, if you think of like what, you know, grandparents wear or do they have a cane or and what is their upper body? Things are probably hunched, you know, here and then they you know, they talk a little bit slower and there's a, you know what I mean? So, um, you're looking for actors' choices. So not just how do they say the dialogue, but, you know, is that character consistent with everything else, um, that the actor is choosing to do, whether that's the voice, their body position, um, you know, they mention profession, so, you know, uh, and actually, yeah, Adam's Family is a good example. There's um, a character in it who is like a real estate agent, and so he's kind of like, you know, always like wanting to hand out his business card, and he... He talks a little bit like he's wanting to sell you on something, you know, where somebody who is, you know, I don't know, trying to think, a janitor or something is, you know what I mean? They're not going to have the same kind of like swanky talk. So look for the actor choices. Sorry, that was long-winded. Um, although a character's words may define or set the tone, for emotionality, nonverbal behavior usually underscores, enhances, or even contradicts the spoken dialogue. Actors and directors make choices for character portrayal and equipment during rehearsal. The audience sees only the ultimate choice. So this is really important to know um, if you haven't done a lot of theater is that the whole entire rehearsal process for, for you to go and see a finished prod, product is what the actors have spent, you know, six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, working on. And the character that they, um, you know, initially went in and started working with is not the character that you will see in the show. There is a, um, and it's not just, you know, memorizing lines and all of this stuff. It really is a development process. Your character is growing. And a lot of times there are huge changes even between the first weekend that a show runs and then its closing weekend. Part of it is just the actor is more comfortable with the stage and stuff, but the the character has gotten comfortable as well. And so, um, you know, just something else to remember when you're when you're going and watching. Even if you think a production is terrible, you know be interesting to have seen it in rehearsal. <laughs> um, all right, your third one is character interaction. Unless the audience is watching a one-person show, it is observing actors collaborating with other actors, working together as a team called ensemble work, or sometimes chorus, um, is often crucial to the success of the scene. The actors should really seem to be listening to one another and reacting to one another. Dynamic and appropriate character reaction and then in turn to the creation of new reactions are critical to the dramatic process. The interaction of characters as characters must be both logical and interesting to watch. An unengaged actor might appear to be waiting for his or, ne his or her next opportunity to speak. Okay, so and that's just, you know, I said before that also 
tells you the difference between an experienced actor and an unexperienced actor. Unexperienced, whoa, inexperienced. I'm sorry, it's 11.15 at night. Um, so anyway, when you are going and evaluating um, the actors, make sure that you're looking for things like believability, their choices, and their interactions. And, you know, do some research also to support those things. Maybe research the, you know, if it's a Broadway show, research the character um, or the actor that played the character on Broadway. You know, and just kind of compare a little bit. All right. Let's see. All right, so now we are talking about the space and the design. So we've talked about, um, you know, the difference between observation and interpretation. We've talked about what you're looking for as far as analyzing the actors or the performances and performers. I'm sorry. And then... Um, now we are going into analyzing the space, the costumes, the set design, all of that. Okie doke. Seeing in three dimensions. Of course, nearly all people see or think they see real events in three dimensions. Unlike watching an image on the screen at a live performance, the audience must negotiate three dimensionality with all of its possibilities for depth and multiple focus. Although most audiences do not consciously think of stage space in terms of its depth, they usually notice if a sense of depth is absent or if the use of depth is especially striking. Okay, so when you are looking at a theater space, you're assessing too much, um, you know, too many props, too many sets, too few. Why is that? Is there a psychological reason um, behind it. I know it's kind of, it's like, Natalie, it's just a stage, you know what I mean? Like, but a lot of times, um, or it should be every time, but not every, depending on the experience, not every director does this. Every little thing should be thought out. And so if you assess a stage and there's very little set design, what is the point um, that the director is trying to make? Is, you know, is the play itself empty? Are the actors looking for a sense of fulfillment? Um, if there's too much stuff on the stage or it feels crowded, what does that say about it? How about the colors? What are the colors? Is it red? Is it vibrant? Is it in your face? Is it gray, black, kind of like mellow? Is it dark? So all of these you will want to assess. And there's not necessarily a, a right or wrong answer, but you are a critic and these are things that you see. Um, I'm going to sit down at some point and write the <laughs> Motown review. And as a choreographer, that is that is the, a big thing I know and I, I always talk about the choreography and that's not necessarily something that a review has to mention at all but that is just that's a big thing to me and so you may be art kind of may be your thing and so set design is going to be a big thing for you or costumes or whatever it is so um, anyway going on when examining the performance in space it can be instructive to consider space and design choices what are the director and designers attempting to get the audience to see where do they want the audience to look and why, what is the spatial relationship of the actors to each other into the set? All right, they talk about examining scenery. It is no surprise that much of what an audience sees on a stage in performance isn't really what it seems to be. Walls are rarely solid and most often are made of stretched canvas or other lightweight materials so that they can be easily shifted or transported. The audience might see a wall shaking a bit when a door slams on stage. Detail that seems three-dimensional is often painted or enhanced by paint and light. The unseen portions of the scenery are unfinished, only what we see in the playing space matters. The actors in performance often see unfinished scenery, but the audience does not. An audience member knows that the scenery is fake, but is prepared to believe in its reality within the world of the play. So, um, yeah, set design is really cool. A lot of the time, you know, it, it has to be light, especially if it's moved. It may, you know, it cannot be built to um, withstand, you know, 200 years. <laughs> uh, 
um, you know, for example, we in um, Adam's family, we have like a, it's kind of like a bridge balcony thing. And it's, uh, it is not going to come falling down if somebody is standing up on it. But the director has said more than once, like, okay, you know, the six people that are up there, you cannot dance on it. Otherwise, it sways back and forth. You know what I mean? So if, um, if you get a chance to see Adam's family or um, Professor Jack Yatsko's show, you know, see if they can give you or, you know, I'm happy to give you a uh, like quick backstage, you know, tour so you can see how everything works and stuff. Um, pretty fun to see how it's all put together. Uh, there are two basic approaches to creating this world on stage. If the scenery is representational, okay, so that's something you're looking for, representational, it is crafted realistically to look and function just as the scenic location would in the real world, whether interior or exterior. Okay, and then, or it is presentational. It is not meant to resemble everyday life. It may be stylized, abstracted, or suggestive scenery. I don't want to um, give everything away here, uh, but I just am finding with being in rehearsal right now that there are a lot of little things that are kind of sticking out. So. Um, an example of presentational would be in um, Adam's family right now, the ancestors is, is what they're called, but they're, they're kind of like an ensemble or a chorus. They create a tree. So they use their bodies and they create limbs and branches and there's this really teeny tiny girl that's put up on you know, two guys' shoulders and she's holding an apple. This would be a presentational piece of scenery, even though they are um, animate, you know, they're, they're not inanimate objects, they're people, they move. They are um, pretending to be a tree, where something that is represent representational would be a tree you know, is built into part of the set. So that's kind of a difference between representational and presentational there. Most of the time, of course, audiences do not witness, oh, sorry, they, I'll fill you in. I guess there was an accident in, in 1917 in the Broadway production of Peter Ibbotson, the actor John Barrymore was escorting the actress Constance Collier through a large scenic opera house during a moment of majestic romantic spectacle. Unexpectedly, the scenery gave way and toppled to the floor in a cloud of dust and debris amid shrieks and curses from the startled actors. Fortunately, the actors were unhurt, but all of the expectations for a beautiful illusion were spoiled, to say the least. A planned stage composition was destroyed, and it must have been very difficult to recapture the tone of the play after such a disaster. So anyway, most of the time, of course, audiences do not witness such failure, but audience members can still ask themselves, does the scenery seem appropriate for the action that is played? Is the scenery consistent with the style of the play? Is the scenery attempting to suggest a specific historical period? Is the scenery an expression of a completely imaginary location? Okay, so when you are looking at your show, is it representational or presentational? Set properties or props also become part of the scenery. Chairs, for example, are frequently recurring set props and they often blend in with the surroundings at times. However, they take focus and communicate meaning. We see many, many chairs in the aptly entitled French play, The Chairs, circa 1952, by Eugene Ionesco. The playwright calls for the actors to steadily fill the space with chairs that remain empty throughout the performance. The presence and absence is part of the point of the play in which the aging characters anticipate a great moment that is ne that never comes. On the other hand, a 1982 modern dress British production of Berenice, 1670, by Jean Racine played, uh, placed a single imposing chair on stage and no other furniture. Not only did the chair catch the attention of the audience, it also became a focus of tension because no actor ever sat in it or used it until the play was nearly over. So the audience is sitting there and they're like, just sit in the chair. Once the actress playing the title role finally sat in the chair, the action carried dramatic weight because the tension was finally released. 
After viewing a performance, you could ask yourself, are the set props merely sittable, standable units that are meant to indicate place and provide conversational units for the actors, or do they contribute more? Are the set properties communicating the thought or symbolism? Do they mean something, okay? So, when you uh, review your show, is there a specific prop that is used a lot? Is it a piece of furniture? Is it just merely there so that somebody can sit down or use it, pick it up, or does it have more meaning than that? Um, all right, now we get to costume. So this is another thing you will want to examine. Actors, set design, costumes. It is easy to take costumes for granted and associate the choices strictly with the character being observed, almost as if the character were a real person who pulled these clothes out of the closet that morning. And I have a little note. I'm not sure. I think it's actually touring through TPAC this year. Uh, we saw it last fall because it came through Charlotte, but Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Um, and while I don't agree with, they rewrote the book, which means they rewrote the script, and sometimes it would just be nice to go see, like, the classical version and not somebody trying to beef up the version because they think it needs an update and then it just turns out terrible. Um, but the costume changes, you know, because Cinderella goes from rags to a ball gown and then from a ball gown to rags was incredible. So sometimes the costumes can kind of take precedence <laughs> um, over anything else in the show. And with Cinderella, that is definitely the case. But, um, you know, so you're not, not everything is going to, there, there are some shows that people may just be in street clothes that you're like, okay, did that come from that person's house? But then there, there's a lot that goes into costumes such as the Cinderella um, being able to you know, magically change rags to a ball gown in seconds. Um, there's really not a whole lot to this section, but questions might be raised about appropriate color and texture of the costume's relationship to the costumes of other characters in the play, or the character's social position, economic status, occupation, age, and gender. So, analyze the costumes. All right, understanding style. This is a big one, and not to be confused with text analysis style, which we will get to. I know it's a little confusing because this is this chapter is referencing your final paper, which you can write anytime. But what we will work on for your second paper is text analysis. Um, and remember, your first paper is going off of chapter one. Um, the you know you can either research a theater, different type of theater, or you can research like a theater and. All right. So understanding style. Style is a complex term, and people use it frequently with a variety of meanings and intents. Some people mean it. In superlative sense, such as she has style and grace, without providing modifiers for the word style. Such uses of the word style, however, tell us little about things theatrical. We will use style to suggest manner of expression and methods of onstage behavior as they affect composition and performance. Style is dictated by language. Poetry, prose, and dialect style is identified by character movement and social manners, by changes in fashions and architecture, clothes, furniture, and decoration. On both low and high economic scales, style is expressed by music, painting, and dance. In short, style is heavy, heavily reliant on the period of history, the economic status of the characters, cultural values, and the geographical region or specific locality of the world that the style reflects or suggests. Um, style can be a method of authenticating a place or a time. Um, so basically, you know, what is, when does the play take place? Does the verbiage in the show, the costumes, 
the mannerisms, the set, does that all align? It's not necessarily that it has to align, but if it doesn't align, why is that? Um, there's, and the theories just can go on and on and on, but there are um, post, I'm pulling from graduate work, postmodern is where you can, you combine like two different decades. And um, like an example of that would be the, It's on the tip of my tongue. They just remade it. it. Has Leonardo DiCaprio in it, and this producer does a lot of film like that. If I remember, I will tell you. But anyway, he combines. He's combining like twenties, like flappers with Beyonce. Um, all right, playwrights also indicate stylistic shifts within the play's text. For example, in 1928, Bertolt Brecht rewrote an 18th century British ballad musical, The Beggar's Opera by John Gay. In his German language, The Three Penny Opera, Brecht kept the London location but moved the action to the 19th century. Okay, remember it was originally 18th century. Composer Kurt Wheel threw out all the old music and inserted funky 1920s jazz tunes. So now you have three different things going on. Brecht called for the characters to be dressed in one historical style, but speak and sing as if in another. Such shifts are by no means unusual in the theater and similar incongruities have been used in varying degrees in many different periods. Shakespeare does this a lot. They'll take, um, Nashville Shakes will take, you know, Midsummer Night's Dream, and they'll set it, you know, in the 1950s or whatever. So, but this, you know, uh, the Beggar's Opera and Three Penny Opera, he just said, all right, here's a melting pot, and we're going to, you know, put all of these different, different things in there. Um, so try and analyze the style. Is it consistent? If not, why? It's not a wrong, right or a wrong answer. It's what is, why, why? A production team may borrow a performance style from one culture and apply it to the plays of another. A production team in the United States or France, for example, might borrow the performance style of Japanese kabuki and apply it to Western plays. Over the last several decades, the West has seen nearly all the famous Greek and Elizabethan tragedies performed in such a borrowed style. Of course, this has also worked in reverse. Japanese directors, for example, have in turn adapted Western plays to their own classical styles or in some cases have drawn from several sources to come up with invented styles. Chinese, Indian, and other Asian and African theater companies have also adapted Western plays to one of their own performance styles and have adopted Western realistic or stylized methods from the 20th century, sometimes with great success. Okay, so lots of sharing. Oh my gosh, this lecture is 45 minutes, I'm sorry. In examining a production, it is helpful not only to recognize the style or styles being used, but also to assess how much styles seem to help or hinder the theatrical event. Does the selection of a new style seem to make older material more accessible? Does the strangeness of an old style allow the audience more objectivity in analyzing action that is set in the past? If, if different styles are used in the same production, does the conflict or contrast make the experience confusing or does it make it more exciting? All right. Oh, okay, I'm going to try and go through the rest of these. Go get another cup of coffee. All right. Evaluating the production. Audience members tend to evaluate a performance event. It seems natural to affix the terms good or bad to a production to recommend the show to others or pan it. Word of mouth is often a powerful tool for getting audiences to see a show and every performance deserves a fair examination. In deciding what worked and what did not, you can learn a tremendous amount about the theatrical process as well as clarify your own preferences and values. All right, considering context and artist intent. Artistic intent. This is very important. To appreciate a show at any 
one of the myriad theatrical venues available, it is important to consider the context of performance. If you attend a professional show such as Wicked or Spring Awakening in a major city like New York, Boston, Chicago, Atlanta, Montreal, or San Francisco, your major objectives might be to have a social evening out of the house and to experience an enjoyable performance. The purpose of the show in that venue is commercial. Producers expect to make money from the performance or it would not exist. You have paid a considerable amount of money for a ticket and you can come expecting the highest level of professionalism in design, execution, and performance. Right? So, TPAC, tickets start at like $65. And that's still like if you want to be in the balcony section, you know what I mean? And, and they go up to like $150. Bucks. Um, if you're going to go see a community theater, typically they're like $10 or $12. So, you also need to associate, you know, the context of the performance, TPAC community theater, so the quality is going to be different. Even within the same city, no more than 10 blocks away, you could attend a performance by a troop of young actors aspiring to professional careers but currently making their living at other pursuits during daylight hours. Through sheer commitment, force of will, and inspiration, the performers have managed to stage a play in a church basement, a warehouse, or the corner of a coffee house. When you choose to attend this, the uh, this theater, you do so with different expectations. The space will not have the glamour or the comfort of Broadway. You do not expect expensive sets or costumes or glossy performances. You can, however, hope to see inspiration, talent, imagination, ingenuity, and commitment. So, when you are writing your reviews, remember, you know, the context that you're writing. I wouldn't say, you know, if you see something at TPAC, might a, or write a harsher review or anything uh, like that necessarily, but it should be better, you know, it should be excellent. You've paid the money to go see it, and these people are being paid a lot of money to, to do this, where, you know, if you are seeing a college production or a community theater, you're dealing with, you know, some inexperience, some lack of funds, um, that kind of thing. So you're, you're still critiquing, but you're not going to expect from a college what you would expect from a professional touring production. So just keep that, keep that in mind when you're analyzing and writing. Beyond the general context of the production, it is helpful to try to articulate the artistic intent of a production. Do you believe that the show is meant to entertain you, to shock you, comfort you in establishing the intent of the artists? You can more effectively evaluate how well the production achieved its goals and ask in the end whether those goals were worth attempting. All right? Taste. We will define taste as the personal inclination and preferences of the beholder of an aesthetic experience. Taste is inextricably tied to our previous experience with all aspects of culture. Leisure activity, including sports and the fine and performing arts, television and all types of popular culture, decoration, architecture, reading, fashion, advertising, nearly everything around us that is created by human beings rather than occurring naturally. Some argue that in theory, regular exposure to many different kinds of theatrical events is likely to broaden appreciation of an array of styles, methods, and genres, of performance. This notion of acquired taste is not always true, however. No matter how much theater a person experiences, that person might always prefer a specific genre, style, or period of work. Someone's list of theatrical preferences could begin and end with American musicals or thrillers or Greek tragedies or Shakespearean comedies. Okay, basically they're saying, you know, some people think, well, in order for you to understand theater, you have to do it, you have to see it all the time. That's not necessarily the case. I probably in some cases a, a more refreshing experience to hear from somebody who has not grown up doing theater or who doesn't see it regularly because they're going to have a, a different impression of it. Something that one person who's, you know, been doing theater for a while is the other person is going to see something for the first time. It's going to be new. It's going to be something that the other person didn't think of. So that is the beauty of it. Um, but and then as you continue to see more plays you'll find out what you like unless it's a play written by tennessee williams i'm really not interested i like some shakespeare i like it in spurts you know but i'm a musical gal so take me to see musicals that's what i love to do okay 
I don't know why I like it. I just do. <laughs> Carefully executed analysis, both written and oral, is likely to improve problem solving, powers of observation, recognition of structure and design, understanding of symbolism, and analysis of cultural correspondences. Um, basically, when you are writing this review, I don't want to hear, it was great. It really touched me. I liked it. It's not a, it, don't take this wrong way, but it's not about you. It's about the, about the show. So you, you are critiquing the show, but it, it cannot be a personal critique. It needs to be in third person, you know, this was good because the actor was believable in this scene, you know, she did yada, 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 yada. It can't be a, well, I liked it because I felt like it really agreed with, you know, my feelings on this and, and where I'm at in life right now. Okay, so stay away from, I don't know why I like it, I just do, and concentrate on, you know, executing analysis, powers of observation, recognition of structure, and design, all that good stuff. Um, if you are moved by an actor's portrayal by a particularly poignant poignant speech or by a powerful song, try to determine why the movement was so successful. Do, you, do particular visual images come to mind? Was the success related to belief in the character? Was the emotional response triggered by the spoken text, by the mimetic action of the actor, by the music underscoring it, by the character isolation created by the lighting? Perhaps this action was very close to the audience or safely removed. What do you remember that could have triggered the emotional response? Okay, and again, it's not, well, I cried because of this. You know, this scene was extremely moving because so and so, whatever. All right, so there's all the positive, okay, but then there's the I just don't like it, which doesn't count either. I just don't like it is the too easy response to a player performance that confuses, offends, bores, challenges, or mystifies an audience member. A spectator can grow frustrated by an event or simply dismiss it as unimportant. Sometimes audiences give up quickly on an artistic experience or they might struggle with it for hours or even days. If a production does not appeal to you, it is important to think about why. Were you bored, offended, confused? What caused this response? Were the production choices inappropriate? What or was the material uninteresting to you? So going back to Pippin, while I could have just been like, it was bad and it sucked you know, I can analyze it and say, you know, because the audience was not sure whether the characters were speaking to the audience or to themselves, whether they were actors portraying a character, you know, the audience left confused. All right. Um, and, and that that says right there that the production was confusing, but it, it doesn't doesn't become this like personal thing of like, well, I thought it was awful, and so now I'm never going to go see it again. Um, all right, the role of the critic. This is you. A few people make a career out of experiencing and evaluating production and sharing that viewpoint with the public. Theater critics have a difficult job. They work with one foot in the theatrical community and the other in the public arena. They serve as arbiters and entertainers simultaneously. The ideal theater critic provides a fair, yet interesting critique of a very complex event, usually under a deadline. Normally they have like 24 hours. People who write about the theatrical productions often have a complicated relationship with the arts community. In, past theater, in the past, theater critics were sometimes closely connected with a particular theater or performer and used their reviews as a form to build public support. The critic and the audience. Critics have a responsibility to the readers, listeners, or viewers they serve. Newspapers, radio, television, and internet sites employ critics to cover entertainment events and pass along information to their audiences. The simplest review gives information about the show, where, what, when, and ticket information. An effective review gives the consumer enough information about the show to make an intelligent decision given personal tastes and priorities. 
that is not what you're doing. If the review includes criticism, in other words, analysis, interpretation, or evaluation of what was done, it is important that the writer support any judgment about the production with description. Aha! That's you. The job of a critic is not only to judge a production. When exciting things are happening on stage, the review helps to spread the word. The critic serves as a link between the theatrical production and its potential audience the critic and the artists. Some theater artists who have been hurt by negative reviews understandably look on critics with, sus with suspicion or even contempt. It is disheartening to invest the enormous amount of time and energy required by production only to have such efforts spoken of harshly in public. Given the potential damage from a negative review, it is important that critics do their best to provide balanced coverage, praising good work, as well as pointing out aspects that were below par. Um, a good critic also cultivates sensitivity to the nature of the production and its aim. Professional or amateur, large or small budget. Okay? So, you know, whichever show you choose to critique, you know, you want to do it constructively. Okay? Because, um, who knows? Maybe you write this and you submit it to a paper and it's published. You know, your actors that are being reviewed will, you know, learn a lot as far as what to, you know, um, how to improve their performance. So again, I'm really all about the why. So if you think this character portrayal is really good, why? What did they do? If you think it's really bad, why? What did they do? Okay? Why, 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 why? The critic and the historical record. It is often produced, uh, although criticism is often considered merely as, uh, I'm lost, I'm sorry. Nope. It is often produced for immediate consumption and is discarded with the daily newspaper. A piece of criticism essentially becomes part of the historical record. Students of the theater rely on reviews, for example, to reconstruct productions from the past and learn about preferences in different time periods. The internet has provided easy accessibility to many newspapers and periodicals that were previously considered obscure. A daily critic must first satisfy the more immediate needs of the contemporary audience and media, but it is important to keep in mind the possible reach of a review and write with as much accuracy and thoughtfulness as possible. When I was... Um, I had a dramaturgy class uh, in my graduate program, and one of the things I had to do was pull up a review, and I pulled a review up from like the 1800s. So you think you're submitting a paper, but in 200 years, somebody might be pulling up your review. So make it good. All right, a second look at production. Professional critics sometimes return to a production to see whether their original rave or pan review still seems justified or to see how a production might have grown or diminished. Critics sometimes back off from their original positions or clarify them and declare an even greater admiration or contempt for the production in question. It is clear, however, that these critics who make their living by reviewing live performance and often have remarkable abilities to analyze incisively after seeing new material just once still notice many things that they apparently missed the first time. So, yeah. All right, writing about productions. This is especially for you. You will probably be asked to write about theater as a student. Writing about the theater encourage, encourages personal exploration. Sometimes one of the greatest pleasures of experience a play is talking about it afterward with friends or colleagues, learning what others saw and what they thought, crystallized your own reactions, crystallizing your own reactions and reaching a greater depth of understanding Whoa. in trying to communicate with someone else. Writing goes a step beyond talking. It forces you to recognize what you feel and think. It encourages you to verbalize a point of view in a very specific way and requires you to organize your thoughts. Writing about theater is as about other things is a way of thinking. It leads the writer to make concrete decisions. Precision of thought is necessary to communicate on paper. When writing, a person must connect in a very personal way with the experience, and in producing a document, the writer is encouraged to support assertions with evidence. 
Your piece of writing is meant to convey your thoughts about the theatrical experience to the reader, and in creating it, you may you expand the chain of communication that began with the notion in the play writes mind. Oh, this is so important. And it's so important that you do this not not just like for these papers, but in in all of your classes in in life to be able to write and clearly express your thoughts will help you in everything, in everything. Um, yes, so good. All right, so we are almost done, but I have like a whole entire page to read you because it was all, I just found a lot of good things about this chapter. Once you have made arrangements, it's, whoa, sorry guys. Once you have made arrangements to see a performance, you need to decide whether to read the play in advance if it has been published. This choice is a matter of personal preference. Reading the play ahead of time will make you better prepared to analyze the production, but surprise value could be lost. Your choice might be different depending on the play. If you are seeing a straight play, I would recommend reading the play and maybe reading it a couple of times just so you know what's going on. A musical, I don't think you're, unless you're seeing Pippin, I don't think you're going to have um, as hard of a time figuring out what's going on. When you arrive at the theater, take note of the theater space if it is new to you. What kind of audience are you part of on this particular evening? Okay, are you going to a Sunday matinee or are you going to Saturday night? Uh, check out the program and be sure to take it home with you. It will give you information that you need about the theater personnel, spelling, and dates. Many theaters provide program notes that are designed to deepen the audience experience. These notes often include um, short biographies and criticism of the player, previous productions, production histories, or related graphics. When the show begins, turn your full attention to the stage. Let yourself become involved in the world of the play. Don't try to analyze or figure out the play or production yet, and do not take notes during the show, maybe during intermission. We know that this is a common practice, but we firmly believe that it is not a good idea for two reasons. It is very often distracting to the audience members seated around you, and if you are writing, you are not experiencing the performance. You have pulled yourself out of the artistic experience as it meant to occur. If you feel panicky that you will not remember enough to write a paper, it is perfe perfectly acceptable to take notes furiously during intermissions, and we highly recommend doing so immediately after the performance. Trust yourself. If you are focusing on the experience, you will retain far more than you ultimately need to analyze the production. It is important to record your impressions as soon as possible after witnessing the performance, however. Take notes quickly, brainstorming, don't worry about sentences or grammar. First, briefly describe your own feelings during and after the show, then analyze what made you feel or react in specific ways. Record what you remember, images, lines of dialogue, anything that stood out to you. Write down sensory impressions, color, sounds, light and dark, make lists of adjectives to describe particular parts of the production. Although the theater is a subjective experience, it is important to be as objective as possible in supporting what you say about production by providing evidence. That's my dryer, sorry. You will describe the way in which the production elements created or failed to create the world of the play. Perhaps you believe that the production did a fine job of creating an eerie, suspenseful mood. Your support might be that the dark atmosphere with patches of isolated light and music that crept in at the most tension-filled moments helped to create a threatening mood. The following is a short list of tips for writing about production. Always identify the play, playwright, or equivalent theater, or place of performance and date you saw the production. Identify the event precisely. Use your program to credit the artist whose work you are now discussing. The lighting designer and the actor playing Hamlet have names. Please use them. Avoid using the words good and bad. They don't tell the reader anything useful. Use descriptive, descriptive adjectives instead. Was the acting, for example, believable, stylized, overblown, subtle? Why? What Was the set colorful or efficient? Ba-bam! Okay. You've got this. Wow, that was a long lecture, but lots of good stuff. Lots of, um, I'm very passionate about this subject. If you have any questions, 
please let me know that that really the chap the book does a great job and I hope that I was able to give you clear examples um, for your paper there are there's at least one example paper in module one or getting started I think it's getting started that you can look at and just kind of follow um, basically you want you know an introduction what you're going to be talking about you want to cover like in two or three lines uh, this you know the story I don't want a summary but just two or three lines of what the story is about the writers the composers all of that good stuff and then you can go into description about the characters the set the costumes choreography if you want um, anything else that stands out to you musical direction maybe maybe your music people um, the other good thing to do would be in I know that you'll see there's one that's like the and it's a critique of the sound of music the NBC's live production or whatever um, that you want to come up with some kind of a quirky little um, name for your paper okay so if you you know whatever show you end up seeing try and incorporate it can be like if it's a musical it can be part of the song um, I know for the sound of music uh, which was just it needed some work it was you know how do you solve the problems in NBC's sound of music live and it's you know how do you solve a problem like Maria is one of the it's one of the songs in there so it can be it can be a song it can be um, dialogue that you use specifically I would do a little bit of research but I would write your paper and then I would give it a title um, more than anything please support and give me the whys I um, want to you know I want everybody to have the opportunity to learn the only way to you know figure out how to write a good paper is to be critiqued and then then correct that so everybody is going to have an opportunity to um, you know rewrite if they need to your first two papers the theater critique if you get it to me before it's due I can critique that for you and get it back to you so that you can rewrite and then submit as a final paper but if you choose to submit December 7th or whatever the deadline is then I I won't have time you you know grades are due and so we won't be able to do that that is why I'm encouraging you to go see a show sooner or later sooner than later um, yes I think that's it sorry that I'm a little um, scattered at the moment I'm, I'm hoping that I'm giving you all of the information that you need but um, chapter 3 is a good one there's examples to follow and please let me know if you if you have any questions I would love to help all right if you are reading this before or listening to this before Labor Day have a great Labor Day spend some time with your family and enjoy the lake um, if not, I hope you had a fabulous Labor Day. See you soon.